Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, start off this morning by introducing uh, our visitor. Uh, Professor Dr. Gunther Feltin is uh, from Germany, but for 20 years he's been coming to Thailand and working uh, at the University in Chiang Mai. Uh, Professor yeah, Dr. Gunther is a very unusual man. He's both an academic and a businessman, which is very unusual in, in Europe. Um, a lot of European academics would consider being a businessman academic as bad, as something that, that's not good. So Professor Dr. Gunther, I think, will be a very interesting speaker for you this morning. As well as being a, a, an academic, he started his own business and is now um, uh, owner and involved with several companies. And they're now his, his first company is now the world's largest uh, exporter, import of Darjeeling tea. So as well as being a, a successful academic, he's also a very successful businessman. And I'm sure his talk to you this morning uh, will be very interesting. So I'd like to introduce you now, and please give a very warm welcome to Professor Dr. Gunther Faltin. Thank you. Every 18 months, the capacity of the chips 
doubles. And it has been right for almost 30 years or so. So we have some uh, base for predictions. But let's look at it more closely. For example, look at politics. Is it predictable? It looks like that. But would you have imagined something like the 9-11 event in the US? Nobody had ever thought of something like that is possible. Or that people are going on war in Afghanistan and Iran. Or that there is a threat of fundamentalism and the threat of terrorism almost present everywhere in the world. Or take the North African upheavals. Did anybody expect that suddenly in a series of countries there were upheavals in states that were regarded as rather stable? Whether you like them or not, they were regarded as rather stable. That's politics, just. So what about economics? It looks rather predictable. Did anybody predict the subprime crisis in the US? Did anybody predict the bankruptcy of such a stable and world-renowned company like Lehman Brothers? Or did anybody expect the European debt crisis? Let's look into technology. Anybody 10 years ago who thought that there is something coming up like Facebook or Twitter and something like the iPhone or that communication with the rest of the world is practically for free? Finally, let's look into natural disasters. That looks like something that has been in the world for all times. There is nothing new with all space. But there is something new in earthquakes that they have an impact because of a nuclear power plant that has much more impact than any time before that ever an earthquake could uh, create. Or look at the Hurricane Katrina in the US. Not that this is the first uh, strong hurricane in history, but it was the first hurricane that had such a damage because there were the oil installations and other uh, facilities and the impact of the hurricane suddenly was much bigger than anything before. So, I think we can conclude that with the future there are things that are unpredictable and that have an impact that is unpredictable. Why do I emphasize on this? Because we have to prepare somehow for the future. We should not get unprepared into situations that we are not able to deal with. We should prepare ourselves. But how? If we don't know what is going to happen. I think there is one answer. And that is, it's about empowerment. Education is about empowerment. Everybody thinks education is about teaching and subjects and how to get the content in your head and memorize it and so on. But I think basically the education is about empowerment. You cannot plan for the future. Take a football game. You cannot plan, plan for the 57th minute of the game. But what you can do is empower people that they have strengths in an unpredictable situation like the seventh minute of a football game. So what we have to do is to build strengths and empowerment for us to be capable to deal with unexpected situations. And we already see it's not just about teaching the old stuff that may help us to deal with unpredictable situations. It's not about memorizing. What it is about is to understand the new situation, to understand that there are new problems, unexpected problems, and how to get to 
solve them, how to get a solution to that. That's education, empowerment. So, first of all, empowerment is not an easy subject. Teaching a subject is easy, but empowerment is not an easy subject. Empowerment is a complex phenomenon and has a lot of facets to it. And, and that's when you come into play, it has a creative dimension. It's not just teaching stuff. It has a creative dimension. And that's in part beyond academic discourse. Because the moment you talk about creativity, you somehow get into conflict with the traditional academic discourse. And we have to insist that scientific disciplines is something, is one side. And they insist on their standards, on academic rigor, and they, of course, expect respectability for their subjects. But if you are in empowerment, it's not the same as teaching or learning scientific disciplines. We must not let this academic rigor and respectability curtail, restrain, constrain this phenomenon. That's a very important point. We talk about empowerment. We do not talk about repeating scientific disciplines. The aim of science is to understand reality. And to do that, they are building models. And of course, they have to try to reduce complexity so that they can deal with single factors, single influences. So, to do scientific work is one thing, but these models cannot really fully represent reality, the complexity of the real world. They cannot do that. That is the problem. So, we need not stick too closely to scientific discipline if it's about practice and if it's about empowerment. If education is about empowerment, it's not enough to lecture, to look at the content, to listen to content of it. And if empowerment is reduced to lecturing and if reduced to traditional education, it's even alienating the people who have to participate in this. One thing that is quite well a research. That is, you cannot memorize things very well if you don't use the subject that you have learned. You need to use it. You need to apply it. Only by using is it stored and is it becoming a part of you. It's becoming a part of your competence. Hence, you have to insist that the subjects, if they, they should be valuable for you, that the subject somehow are applicable. And that means they must fit into your personal environment, into your personal abilities. And it should be possible to apply it, to use it in the present, in the here and now, and not only in the distant future. Because then you have forgotten about it, and you wasted your time. So we have some demands on education if you take yourself seriously and if you take your competences that you want to get seriously you have to put some demands on education not just sit down and listen education should strengthen people not weaken them and quite often they weaken people why? because there is failure there is failure you don't pass the test so it's making you feel guilty, ashamed. It's making you feel you are not up to the standard. Something is wrong with you. And your parents, your teachers, whoever may have said to you, you are not, you are not correct. You are not feeling well with what is expected from you. But it's the other way around. It's failure that is 
the teaching method, failure that is a feedback, that is a training method, like a boxer with a sparring partner. You learn by applying, you learn by your mistakes, you learn by training. Failure is an opportunity for improvement. This is particularly so in my field of entrepreneurship. Your idea might be wrong very often. Your idea that you start a company is wrong. Research says up to 70% of the assumptions that you do when you start a company are wrong. So how can you succeed? By realizing your wrong and changing. Changing to what works better. That is a problem of entrepreneurship. And if you insist in just managing in business administration, you may not realize you are wrong. It doesn't help that you improve your work, that you strengthen, that you accelerate, that you put in more work if you are going in the wrong direction. It's better you realize early in time that you are on the wrong path and change it. That's the point. Realize it. Be open. Be aware that you have to change. There's an old saying, if you discover you are riding a dead horse, dismount. Get down. Don't continue. But most people continue. They double their efforts. They hit on the horse. They try to carry the horse. They try to give it medicine or something. But if you discover you are riding a dead horse, get down, dismount. That is something. So we have to understand education. Very much all is about failure. Failure is not something that you miss the requirements, but that we learn from. To avoid a misunderstanding, I'm not talking about things like laissez-faire. No discipline, summer help, things like that. I do not talk about that. What I'm talking about is that we need alternatives to the traditional educational system. That we have to react to the unpredictable future. That we have to think about how can we better make use of the human potential. That's the point. You have human potential. Every child has it. And we have to build on that and not lecture the people and give them the scars that they don't pass, that they miss. I was working with street children in Manila and we had a conflict with the teachers and the social workers. We wanted to listen to the children, what their interests are, what they are doing. And the teachers wanted to know the curriculum, how to teach the children. And you cannot teach street children. They are they are tired, they work at night, so they are tired, they fall asleep in school. So I think it's a crime to take these children to school knowing very well that most of them will drop out. So on top of all the disadvantages that they have, they have new scar. So they drop down, they miss, they fail. I think it's a crime to do that. We know it in advance. They cannot follow these middle class uh, Western type uh, schools that are uh, have spread all over the world. It's a crime. You have to deal with their particular situation. They have skills. They fend for themselves at a young age. Who is able, able to do that? Middle class children in my country would not be able to do that. These ch street children did so. And to deal with their comrades, with police, with corrupt bureaucracy, and all kinds of of problems, they tell very well, well, they have some uh, skills, they have some uh, competences, but in school these competences don't count, so don't get them into traditional schools. Do something with them that fits into their environment. That is being making use of human potential and not using education to hit at them and give them a scar that on top of everything else they they miss and fail school. I like this person, Kendall Robinson. 
He's a meanwhile very famous person. He was even knighted by the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, knighted means he became Sir Ken Robinson. So well respected, well uh, publicized, well renowned uh, researcher and promoter of a new type of education. And he says, we are born with a lot of powers. We are not born empty. Look at children. They are not empty. Look at children before they go to school. They are very lively. They are highly interested in everything. They are highly motivated. They are running around. They are asking their parents hundreds of questions. Parents get tired of them. Sometimes they don't know the answer. Why is it that the sky is blue? I wonder whether you could explain that. Why it is blue color, why the red color, or gray color, or white color. So, they have a lot of, nature has capacitated them with a lot of powers. And do we use them? I always ask my colleagues, I'm an economist by education, but I'm in a faculty of education. I ask my colleagues, how come that these children that are so lively, that are so motivated, after they get to school, after even one year, they start to drop their questions. And now you need experts in education, highly uh, educated experts, that motivate these children. So how come they were full of motivation? How come that they start dropping their capacity to ask questions. Something must be wrong with the system. And what is wrong is that these powers that are there, the natural equipment that come with young people, that is our nature, that is invisible with animals, they have some inbuilt capabilities to fend for themselves and to deal with the world. They have created that in millions or billions of years. So we have to use them. And it's quite clear, our educational system use only a fraction of these powers. Only a fraction. They should be used much more. That's a good sentence of Pablo Picasso, the French painter. All children are born artists. Yes. The problem is when they come to school and they get all these down, down pressure and they, uh, this negative feedback in school and everywhere. So how, how can they remain, how can they resist, how can they maintain their capabilities when they grow up? Yes, academic ability is important, no question about that. But what is it that we learn in university? Is it really academic ability or is it only part of it? Is it only a selection of it? And Robinson says it's mostly dealing with words and numbers. That's quite a, only a part of the word, only a selection of the word. In reality, most things are not just in words and numbers. Richard Branson, you may have heard of him, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in contemporary times. Richard Branson, with all his companies, world famous. What did he, how did he deal in school? He could deal with numbers when he was confronted with concrete problems, yes, in that situation. He says suddenly those numbers came to life. It wasn't fun working with them. And how was it in school? I used to be a real idiot as far as mathematics was concerned. I was an idiot in school in mathematics. But he's a genius in dealing with numbers because you know 
to run a company or even to make them big and competitive, it needs a lot of dealing with numbers, yes. And that's an interesting thing. You know, the framework, the setting of teaching usually is you sit, like you sit here. You sit. But there are a lot of people who cannot really learn, who cannot enhance their capabilities by just sitting. They need to move their bodies. It's like me. I, if you force me to sit down on a desk, I cannot really work well. I have no ideas anymore. I need to walk around. That's a very old tradition. Even the Greek culture knew about this. And there were monasteries where the kind of doing work, doing research, reading, was by walking along. Very pathetic. By walking along. At home I have no desk sitting. I have standing desks, four of them. For each field that I work in, I have one standing desk. And I need to walk in between. And by walking, the brain also moves and walks. And there was a famous Danish philosopher, Kierkegaard, Sir Kierkegaard. And in his biography, you can read, he worked with six different standing desks. Six different standing desks. And he said, whenever he works on one subject, he has a lot of ideas for the other subject. So he walks to the next standing desk and puts something down, and then he continues walking. So he was walking all the time. So he's not the single person, or I'm not the single person. So to confine uh, learning to sitting and watching the blackboard is a strange idea. It's a really strange idea that we should drop. And with this standard, standardized curricula, we wonder, or we need not wonder why our students will see without imagination and without being inspired. So standardized curriculum, one size fits all, is something like a strange idea. I say that because I want to encourage you, not just the lecturers, the teachers, but also you as students, to take education in your own hand and not just let, let it be done by others and by a system that is not up to the, up to the date, up to modern uh, psychology and modern understanding of how people learn. Actually, a small story in between. I was invited uh, as an expert from the European Union to Russia and the, the procedure was that uh, the Russians could uh, select who they wanted as an expert, as an advisor. So I flew there in for one day and I was asked to listen to their ideas and give a comment. And I went to St. Petersburg to listen and they said, we have to increase the standards, we have to increase the level of education. We need more mathematics, we need more sciences. You have to put more stuff into, uh, into uh, the same time, so to increase the standards. And to do that, we need more, more front lecturing. Because to raise the level of education means you have to learn more in a shorter time. So it was putting a curriculum together and putting even more content in it and lecturing the people and expect from them that they raise their level of knowledge. And I grew a bit angry by listening to them and I was thinking for a moment whether I should really uh, 
look for this assignment, for this job. And I decided I drop it. I, I'm not, I would not be happy to be an advisor to this very conventional, very old fashioned, very out of time kind of education. So I put all my politeness together and said, look, it's great what you are doing. The, curric the curriculum that you have in mind, the teaching that you have in mind is great. Fantastic. I wouldn't change anything. Just one small thing I would change. Very small thing. Leave everything as it is. One small change. And my suggestion for the small change is change the sign on the entrance door. Change it and call it Museum of Pedagogy. Museum of Pedagogy. Yes, you are alive in Museum of Pedagogy. It's not up to the, let's say, it's not up to the time. You are a museum, but a lively one, with people who act, not just a dead, dead body museum. And I expected that he said, okay, goodbye. We will look for somebody else. Or even that they get very angry. Something completely different happened to my surprise. They said, actually, nobody has told them something like you so brutally about what we are doing. But we tell you, secretly, we have thought the same thing. Are we on the right way? Are we on the right path? for an intelligent education? Are we really enhancing the capacity of our students? And I got the job, to my surprise. They selected me. So I worked for three years with them on entrepreneurship, not on lecturing, but on entrepreneurship. I would even state that we systematically drain the creativity out of our students by using this old-fashioned, outmoded system of education we train the creativity of the students. We are stifling their individual talents and abilities. And we probably kill their motivation to their best and values. A funny example that I took from Robinson is, you know what a paper clip is? You can make a game with your friends or students or wherever and say, what can you make from such a paper, paper clip? You can do a lot of things. You can scratch your back or you can use it as a fish hook or a lot of things. And the test was, it was an experiment, social science experiment. What do people find out for different uses of such a paper clip. And the average was about 10 to 15 ideas how to use the paper clip. And of course there are some geniuses. And they come up with up to 200 or more. So the experiment was the following. Give that task to kindergarten children. How many ideas will they have? How many solutions to how you can use a paper clip? And then make a study, a time series, a longitudinal study. What happens when children are in school? Well, you would expect, you would expect that in school, by raising their creativity, by raising their brain, making them more capable of thinking that they find more solutions. That they find more solutions when they are 8 to 10 or 13 to 15. You would expect that because we are talking about education, enhancing the capabilities of children. So measured on how many ideas, how do you zoom? So what do you expect? The result was it deteriorates. They got less ideas. They became less creative. And something like education, like a heavy stone, 
books or something on their brain, they deteriorate. It's you. It deteriorates. It makes you deteriorate in your creativity. So you have to do something to get those teachers not to fall into that trap. That's Elvis Presley. The teacher said his voice would ruin the sound. find anything remarkable about him. My own story is I was in school and supposed to learn violin. I took classes for five years playing the violin. And I always wanted to play like these Hungarian gypsies that play in restaurants and make money and that sound I like. I want you to play like that. But my violin teacher said, no, you have to play well, the notebook. That is la 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 la. After five years, I throw away that violin and never touched it again. And I found yet yeah, that's how it is how it's happening. I never dared to criticize the teacher. And then I met a person. Dr. Becker in Berlin. She's a piano teacher. And she said, first of all, she is listening what makes the students eager to learn piano. And she said, I had one student, not very talented, and he said, I want to play Shostakovich. And she said, oh, Shostakovich, it's far too difficult for you. And she said, no, I would like to play Shostakovich. So she understand that was something that made him like it. So she played Shostakovich with him. Probably not correct or not very sophisticated, but he wanted to play Shostakovich, so she did it. And probably he learned a lot, because it was a challenge far more than he could play at that time. That's how to react between the teaching and the, the person that you have in front of you. That's the point. Ivan Illich, a famous uh, teacher, a famous philosopher, a famous person, wonderful person. I was lucky to meet him in the 80s. And he said, everybody thinks that learning happens in school, or learning is a, something that has to be in school, or that, of course, learning is taken from school. He says, that's wrong. Not at all. Most people don't get their knowledge and their capabilities from school. Most learn when they are in a relevant social environment. When they have access, unrestricted, hopefully, access to something that is highly intensive in, in learning. That gives them motivation that show them something they can deal with. That's about learning. We have to talk about learning environments. And these learning environments must be something that allows imagination and passion. And without that, it's wasted time. Better let the people go to sleep. There's an interesting finding, research finding, and it's particularly published by Gerald Ritter, a German but world-renowned neurobiologist from the University of Göttingen. And he has written a lot of books about it. And he says, it's passion that changes the brain. If you follow your passion, if you have the, the the luck that you are dealing with something that arouses your passion, then your brain starts really working and even is improving. Is improving. That's an, a revolution. That not by disciplining yourself and listening, but by 
following your passion, your, even your brain moves. And how is he doing that? By getting new synapses. Or using new synapses and additional connections between them. So follow your passion and your brain in book. That's revolution. That's absolutely revolution. That's the point. Finding the passion changes everything for you. Finding your passion. Quite the contrary what the setting of school is doing. Setting of school is doing. You are, you are empty, you are empty kind of thing. You need to be filled with knowledge. And by years of uh, exposing you to teaching and to knowledge, you more or less fill up like a glass of water and then you have something that you can use. Finding your passion. Because that moves you and that makes you something uh, to be valuable. And there's an interesting finding at that point. That is, people very often overlook their special talents. And how come that this is being done? It's because they think it's so easy. I can draw easily, not nothing special. I don't work hard for that. I can, uh, it falls, it falls in place. Something very simple for everyone. But it's not simple to everyone. It is something gifted to you. And the point is find out where your gifts, where your talents are. Find out. And not listening so much, being lectured from others. Find out where your special talents are. And why is it overlooked? Because People are in the belief that it cannot be valuable if there was no endeavor behind to develop it. It cannot be valuable if there was, was no hard work to, to achieve it. That's why people overlooked it. It was done by a Armenian researcher, Shakir Young, and she interviewed people who were quite successful. And they were lucky that they found what they what they really moves them. And she says a lot of people, even in their whole life, do not uh, encounter their real talents because they were never spoken about in school. They were never aroused somewhere. People went to school, they did an education, and they went for a job, and they did the requirements for the job. But they never followed their own inner voice or their inner talent. It was not, it was not allowed. So one important thing is trying to find out, trying to find out what are the special gifts that you have. Is there something that is easy for you, but not so easy for anybody else? For me, for example, it's very easy to like chuckling with uh, sticks, uh, creating new business models, like playing with a, a, a jigsaw, a puzzle, and uh, put it, try out and put it as long until it fits. I thought it's very easy, everybody can do it. But I learned that people say, oh no, it's very complicated. It's easy for you to do, but it's not easy for everybody. It's not easy for most of the people, but it seems to be a special talent for you. And if you do it a while, of course, you become even better. So, I would believe that the prime task of the educational system is to help recognize and nurture those talents of students, hopefully early in their life. It's luck. It's happiness to get to your inner talents early in life. So, this was the first part of my speech. I understand that there's a lot of criticism on the educational system 
well-documented, research-based, uh, most of these things that I have explained to you may not be really new to you, it's really well-documented. So the question is why? Why is it that this educational system is changed so little? There is so little progress and still the old pillars of education classroom, a standardized curricula, one size fits all, lecturing, uh, repeating without using it, learning things for the distant future and so on. Why is it still in place? Why is it still uh, widespread that we use a traditional educational system that is really not made for the people, that is really not uh, made for enhancing their capacities? That's a good question. And <clears throat> I believe that there are some tacit assumptions, some silent assumptions, some basic beliefs that are the obstacle of change in our educational system. And I think it's worthwhile to look at these tacit assumptions, to look why this system of education is so resilient, why it is so uh, uh, powerful to abstract reform. And I think that the, the, the assumptions go something like that. Of course, there is human potential and people have some passions, but, but, they have to earn money. What about personal fulfillment if you have no income? So, you need a job. You need some economic base, that is, you have to prepare for that job, you need to make money, there is no fulfillment without a certain uh, solid and well-made uh, uh, economic base. So, to, how do we get it? How do we get it? We get it by new technology, we get it by research by patenting research. This research, this patent, these patents, these new findings will create new companies and these new companies there is more jobs and there is economic growth and that's the model. That's the basis. So we need people who help to create new products, new companies, new growth. And it's in research, it's in high tech. I think that's the tacit assumption why we have an educational system that still follows the old hierarchy of subjects. First and foremost, mathematics. Next, the sciences. Then the languages. Then, closer to the bottom of the pyramid, the humanities. And on the bottom of the pyramid, least valuable, the arts. That is the conventional, the old hierarchy of such. Mathematics is the best, science is engineering. Of course, languages, yes, humanities, and the arts is a luxury. There are some arts, yes. If you are a uh, manager in a company, you are on the top, you have corporate wall board, and it's fine with an artist. He fills the corporate wall board, and it's, it's a kind of prestige to be an artist. But it's not really taken so seriously, you know that. So, that is the old highway. Then, why is it mathematics? Because high tech. You need mathematics, you need sciences, you need engineering in high tech. That's the belief. And not only that, we have to raise the standards in high tech. We need to be the first. We need to be, or at least maintain our position in number of patents, in number of innovations. That keeps the thinking of mathematics. And how to learn mathematics by lecture? By 
working hard to increase your standard in mathematics in science. Let's remind ourselves that the concept of modern education, or what is called modern education, was created in the age of the Industrial Revolution. And it's quite clear that at that time it worked well. Why? Because at that time, it was factory work. You needed discipline, you needed a repetitive kind of work, so you needed to train your workers that they keep discipline and they can maintain a repetitive work. That was in the age of industrial revolution. So, at that time, that was an, at least an appropriate system for the demands of the economy. Discipline and repetitive work. But do we have today so much repetitive work in effect? What was best explained in modern times of Charlie Chaplin in the movie? So, we don't have so much repetitive work anymore because the machinery takes over repetitive work. So we more need our brains today. The repetitive work has gone away. Or if it is somewhere, it is in countries with low wages that are still competitive even when they uh, use old modern systems of, of organization of work. So the fact is that we are in the 21st century and competitiveness and jobs do not depend on doing repetitive work because that is taken over by rationalization and machinery. So we need more, another quality, and we need more creativity. We need people who think with their work. And actually, this is turned down by the old type of educational system. What we need is putting new questions. We have to find new solutions. And interestingly, the business people say, yes, we need people who think, who have an entrepreneurial mind, who have a creative mind, and who can think independently. We need these people. And this is important. Now we come a bit to economics and entrepreneurship. And this will be important for you too. Because you have to earn money. How to do it in a way that fits with your talents and your motivation. And we have to understand why do businesses, why do enterprises, new startups need creative people. And it's like that. Let me explain it again. What is the success factor if you found a company? What is the success factor? Is it the invention? Is it research findings? Is it new technologies? It looks like it. And even the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, said, says, look, we have so many research findings. We put so much money in universities and research institutions. We have so much findings. We have so many patents. Why is it that there are not many more companies created? We have the patents. Unlike your country, you have not too many patents. But a lot of companies are created in your company. Strange. So, what is the point to create a company? <coughs> is it the invention? Can you put the invention to the market? Not really. Sometimes yes. there are some inventions that you can easily put to the market. But are there inventions you cannot? Look, the engine that is called Otto Motor, it's a world success. But does anybody buy the engine that is named after its inventor uh, Otto? No. Nobody buys an uh, Otto engine. What you buy is car, an automobile. So it is not the engine that is marketing, 
but it's, I call it a business model. If the business model was the automobile, and the one who really wanted to mass use, usage was Henry Ford. He was not the inventor of the engine or all these things that you need to look up. He was the one who experimented how to put all these things together. So invention is one thing and market is another thing. And you need something in between. And that's the business model. I call it entrepreneurial design. Design always takes more into account the customers and how, how they use it. That's the point. The point is not invention. Invention, research one, is raw materials. But you need people. That's the entrepreneur. You need people who can make use of them, who are creative, to look into the pattern, to look into the research fund and have ideas what to do with it. And it took Henry Ford 18 years to try out how to assemble all these new technological things so that a car is made that functions and is available and achievable and affordable for many people. So, the entrepreneur was Henry Ford, was not the inventors of technical patents uh, who create the car, but people like Henry Ford or other entrepreneurs. But that is very important. You can have a research finding and get the Nobel Prize for it. Whether this finding is successful in the market is a totally other question. Nothing to do with each other. So the invention, the research fund, is a raw material. But it is not the solution. It's not enough. It's a raw material. But to bridge the gap between technology and the market, you need people who think creative, who assemble something creative. That's the point. This even has a name, it's called European Paradox. European Paradox is there are mountains of research findings and mountains of patents. But a small creek, very small creek, tiny creek of new companies, new startups, compared to these huge mountains of research findings and patents. And why is it? that there is not more, this is the explanation. The red circle is missing. You need people who can make use of the patents and the research money on new technology. That is the point. So we have something that explains why we need more creativity. People who can play with jigsaws, who have a creative mind, who try out Interesting. Only 20% 20, 20 of that startup survived the first years. Why? Because the business model is not good enough. That red circle was not well thought through. Even those who found the company, not so many, but even those few people who found the company, they failed within five years. Loriana Tiefenbord is a lady that was with the MIT Media Laboratory, a famous institution, you know, MIT in Boston, world famous, world renowned institution. She was with that laboratory, media laboratory, from inception. And she says something very important, very important. Don't emphasize too much on technology. Everybody talks about technology, German Chancellor. Everybody thinks it's technology. In the modern world, technology is a decisive point to stay competitive, to get new jobs. No, it's not. It's a raw material. It's not technology. Technology is a raw material. You have to do something with it. You need creative minds. You need entrepreneurs, innovative entrepreneurs who can use this technology. There's far too much emphasis on creating the technology compared to the emphasis on creating entrepreneurs 
That's the busy thing entrepreneurs. Carl Vesper is an American professor of entrepreneurship, and he has said something very interesting. And those of you who thought we have nothing to do with business, with business with business administration, listen, there is something to do. It is the development of an entrepreneurial idea is above all a creative process. It's not about technology. It's not about teaching or something. It's a creative process. And you can even compare it to an artistic creative act. That's the point. You are the one who have good preconditions and good access and you have a good starting point for putting new ideas into economic use. And don't mix it up with the boring stuff, or for many people, boring stuff of business administration, keeping records.